it's funny when they, whenever we do these baptism Sundays and then the kids look at me and they're like, how'd you do that so fast? You get completely changed. It's 18 years of experience. You just know how to run to your office and run straight back and not knock anybody out of the way when you do it. It's, uh, today, uh, I did promise everybody that my message would be shorter because of the baptisms. And so you guys stepped up and we had, that's why I think we had a lot of people baptized. I don't know. I, I'm working with my own faith and trying not to take it personally. Um, but we, I did want to continue. Um, and for those of you that are joining us for the first time, when you hear that we've been doing a sermon series since September, you go, great, I'm just going to check out and I'm not going to listen because I have missed like the three and a half months leading up to this Sunday. No, this morning's message, I, I want to make it personable, personable? Is that the real word? Personal <laughs> for each and every one of us. Whether we say we're a follower of Jesus or not, right? It's, it's not just a message for the Christian, the follower of Jesus, the churchgoer, but I believe it's a message for the entire world, right? As we've said earlier, we're stepping into this Christmas season where we're talking about this hope, <laughs> Now, I don't know about you, but the posture of my life looks very different when I am filled with hope compared to when I am hopeless. Do you, you get what I mean by that? When your life is just filled with hope, you stand a little taller, you throw your shoulders back, there's a sparkle in your eye, there's a smile on your face, there's a skip in your step, you become that guy. Or that girl, that everyone at your office is like, oh, here comes Sue again. Oh. <laughs> you know, why is Sue so happy? It's not happiness, it's hope, <laughs> right? And when we become, and we allow our hearts to become so beaten down and so hopeless, suddenly the posture is very different. The shoulders slump, the head goes down, the eyes dim, <laughs> the gut <sighs> starts to do a whole bunch of weird things, right? And so today, I want to talk about what we've been doing all morning. We, when we come to something like this, when we hear people share their story and their faith in Jesus, when we have a team that comes up and sings songs, ultimately, when we gather in this way, the fundamental purpose is not to be religious, it's not, we, we don't just do this because we're demanded to and expected to. We do this because we want to gather and we want to praise God for all that he does. You see, the posture that you take when you come into this space on Sunday is directly related to how your entire week went. I think so often we feel like we get beaten up all week. And so I'm going to drag myself to church on Sunday, if that's kind of your tradition to do so. And boy, Pastor Kevin better really bring it today. Or Paul better sing the songs that I like. Or I'm just going to leave here like not happy, beaten up. And this, this expectation that I have to come here to be filled up in order to survive the rest of the week. And that's why we've been doing this series called The Way of learning to hear the voice of God, whether that's through our Bible reading, whether that's through prayer, whether that's through the people in our lives that are encouraging us and spurring us on, whatever that looks like, we hear the voice of God all week long. And then we come together today on the last day of the week to celebrate and praise and rejoice the week that we had. Today is not the first day of the week to fill you up to go out and get beaten up. It's the last, now depending on your calendar, you'll wait, but on my calendar, Sunday is the last day. No, okay, I'm talking like Bible language here, okay? <laughs> last day of the week, the church tra tradition, we praise God all week, and then we come and we praise him for all he's done. Right, so this is why I want to talk a little bit, just for our, the remainder of our time, promising we have about 15 minutes, <laughs> to talk about the posture of our hearts. <laughs> because it's my heart that will determine the posture of praise before my God. It is the posture of your heart 
that will determine your posture of praise before your God. See, because I could do the flip side. I could talk about all the places where the Bible talks about praise, right? I could just pull out a whole bunch of verses and in my French Canadian guilt, I could guilt you into be obedient to these verses. And anyone, that's kind of how you were raised. If they're sitting beside you and they did that to you, don't raise your hand, okay? But we guilt people out of these religious traditions. Like in 2 Corinthians chapter one, right? Praise be to God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of compassion and the God of all comfort. This is a, com- this is a commandment to praise God, right? Hebrews 13, 15, uh, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer God a sacrifice of praise, right? The fruit of lips that openly professes his name. It's a commandment to praise God, right? Psalm uh, 9, verse 2, I will be glad. I will rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. This is an affirmative action that King David declares, I will praise, (laughs) right? And again, we can look at these things as commandments, that you have to. I could, again, pull out a hundred other verses and I could stand in the back room and say, every single one of you that didn't come into church like this on Sunday morning, you are disobedient to your Bible and make you all feel guilty and then you find some more conservative church somewhere else that doesn't make you do this, (laughs) okay? It's not the point. The point is our heart. The point is our heart. So the text that I I had this text selected months ago because it's a part of this series and this devotional uh, tool that we've been using since September. And and it it might seem a little weird that this is the text I picked to talk about praise. But for me, this is an amazing text for each of us individually to check our hearts, to check our hearts. And then we can use this text to say, how is my heart doing? And are these things actually impacting the posture I take when it comes to praising God. And and if you're here today and you would say, but I'm actually not a Christian, that's awesome. I would love for you to hear this because so often these type of verses are used to criticize you and how you're living your life. And on behalf of Jesus, I would like to say, I'm sorry. This is not a verse to you. If you're not a Christian and some Christian has thrown this at you for how you're living your life, I'm sorry. Because it's a verse to us. It's a hard look at the church. It's a hard look at the pastor, the elder, the leaders, everyone who attends, who says, who've done this, who've put their faith in Jesus. It's forcing us to look at our hearts so that we can actually bring the love of God to you, not the condemnation of church to you. So let me read these words. These come from the... uh, from James, it's right near the end of your Bible, if you want to follow along in your Bible, James chapter four. And what I love about the book of James is the book of James is all, it's so practical, is that your faith should change how you live. (laughs) What you believe about God should make a difference in how you live your life. So James chapter four, again, written to the church, written to Christians. James says these words. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? We've talked about this a lot over the last couple of months, that there's this this battle that goes on. Our flesh wants one thing, but the spirit of God in us wants something else. And we feel pulled in these two directions, right? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. Writing to the church. I'll explain this one in a moment. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and covet. It's like, I desire what that person has. I desire what that person has. I want what you have, but I can't get it. So I quarrel. And then it says in verse three, when you ask, so praying to God, you ask, but you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And then James calls the church this, you adulterous people. When the Bible talks about adulterous in this context, it's like you're cheating on God. You're cheating on him 
by giving your life to something else. And then he continues, don't you know that friendship with the world, it means enmity against God. Like, therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Again, talking to Christians, talking to the church. Right? Or do you think, or sorry, or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? You see, God is jealous for you. And that sometimes when we think of jealousy, we think of like that crazy dude, like who's a stalker, you know, and like showing up in the middle of the night or stalking you online. That's not how the Bible describes jealousy. It's not that. It's that God loves the church so much that he has deposited himself into the heart and soul of every single one of his children. And he is jealous for that. He wants to protect that. He wants to guard that. He wants to nurture that. He wants that relationship there, <laughs> right? It's not the crazy psycho jealous. <laughs> and then he does this, it says in verse six, he gives us more grace. And that's why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. <laughs> so submit yourself then to God, resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you're, you double-minded. See, so Paul's showing that there's this kind of this relationship that we have with God. That God is there. He's close. He's willing. He wants to pour out his love and his grace and his power and his majesty to the church. <laughs> but you, church, got to do your part too. <laughs> Draw near to him. Draw near to him. We draw near to him. And that's why we've been learning everything that we've been learning since September. Why do we read the Bible? Well, because Pastor Kevin said so. And if I don't do it in the YouVersion Bible app, I'm not going to get the little tick marks or I'm going to break my streak. I love streaks. Streaks motivate me on like apps. You have no idea. I'm fully admitting my addiction to social media and I'm going to try and break that. But I like when my prayer app says 15 straight days of praying for my small group makes me feel really spiritual <laughs> and really important. Boy, my men's group needs me. <sighs> Humble yourself. Oh, yeah. okay? It's not because of this guilt. We do it because we want to draw close to him. Why do we pray? Oh, because if I don't pray, I'm not going to get what I want. If you're praying only to get what you want, James reminds our hearts, <laughs> the motive is wrong. <laughs> you have a heavenly father who wants to pour out his blessings and his good gifts. Absolutely. But if you think this is like God must, I serve, I give, I do this, I do this, I do this. So God the Father better hold up his end of the deal. I better get a nice house, a great spouse, a lot of money in the bank account. I'd love to trade in my Dodge Caravan for a Porsche. That'd be great. <laughs> Wrong motive. That's the selfishness of the world. And God doesn't go there. He doesn't honor that, right? Right? We see this all over this place. And so this is why for me, the book of James has become so crucial in the life of the church because it forces us to look at our hearts, forces us to look at our hearts and does my actions, do my actions, does my life line up with where my heart's really at or where I would like my heart to be at, right? And so the big idea, I've said this already. So the condition of your heart determines our level of praise, the condition of our hearts determines our level of praise. And just very quickly, I want to just give three things from this text of James chapter four. I said three. I'm looking at the clock. It might be two. You can follow me on social media. I'll give you the third one later. Okay. <laughs> but start with two things. We'll see if we've got time for the third. Um, what works in our hearts that determines our level of praise? Well, the first is the one that James talks about is our worldly desires. Right? James asks about the origin of the disputes that Christians are having with one another. Again, this isn't Christians angry with non-Christians. This isn't non-Christians angry with Christians. This is Christians angry with Christians. A lot of the time, the reasons why non-Christians have a bad view of the church is sometimes their experience of Christians hasn't been great. And again, if that's you today, 
I'm sorry. I'm sorry that we misrepresented Jesus in your life. Right? But what James shows us here is that these desires have a way of creeping into the heart of the Christian. And when James uses the word desire in the Greek here, it's, it's not just, well, I desire a good marriage or I desire to see more people come to know Jesus. It's, this word in the Greek is the bad version of desire. It, it's malicious pleasures. It's like there's a darkness to it. And because we're still in this fallen flesh, we have a new heart, the Bible tells us when we accept Jesus. We have a new spirit, the Bible tells us when we come to Jesus. But this body likes Putsin. <laughs> and this body hates exercise, hates a good night's sleep. It would rather play video games all night. It would just rather do whatever it wants. But the Bible teaches us that we have to let the spirit change us. And so we have worldly desires. And when you and I, as followers of Jesus, get stuck in worldly desires, you show up on Sunday and all you can think about is what you haven't gotten. The hands go in your pocket. I don't have this yet. I don't have this. I don't have that. And that person over there does. And we covet Right? And so this is why James says you kill each other. And I think what he's doing here, um, he's not saying that the church is actually killing people. If they are, they have a bigger problem going on in this church. <laughs> I hate to pastor that place. <laughs> it's like, oh, duck! Okay, bullets are flying. Okay, sorry, time. I'm watching it, Paul, I promise. Um, <laughs> he's quoting Jesus here. When Jesus said, when you have hatred towards a brother or sister, it's murder. You've killed them. Your relationships in the church matter. We live in a culture today, you get mad at someone, hop up, go to another church. It's so easy to disappear. There's churches all over the city. You don't like this person, I'm out of here. It's hard to work on relationships. It's messy to work on relationships. And if we just become men, women, boys, and girls that just constantly run away from awkward, difficult, uncomfortable conversations... We're just going to be killing one another. And if we do that, we take a very, very different posture. This is why uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, writes to his young protege, Timothy. He says in Timothy 2.12, he says, Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. It's a journey. We are trained to fight against those worldly desires. We don't always win, and that's Okay but we pursue it anyways. <laughs> we pursue it together as a family, right? And we do that in order to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. It's not just so that we can go to heaven one day, but it's so that we can be different today. So we have to ask, what worldly desires are in my heart? And are those desires having an impact on my level to be able to praise God? That's the first thing. Second thing, I already hinted at it because I skipped ahead by accident. <laughs> it's this idea that it's our bad relationships, right? It's our bad relationships. In verse two, it says you kill and you covet. That we, the infighting of the church. It's, 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 and I praise God for our church because we really don't have like next to none of that. And I was going to say that now, so I'm going to like fast and pray to make sure it doesn't now show up to prove me wrong. <laughs> it's kind of funny how the devil works that way. I'm not boasting, I'm not boasting. And if I boast in anything, I'm boasting in Jesus, not us, okay? We're very blessed. But I have friends, colleagues, pastors, and I've watched them get eaten alive by the infighting of Christians. And some of you may know people like that. Some of you may have family pe uh, members like that. Some of, may, of you, that may have been your experience, it's like, why in the name of Jesus? I remember when I was a brand new Christian, I came to Jesus in my late 20s. I went to my very first church business meeting and I watched this group of men completely destroy the pastor and the elders. Like tearing into them verbally. 
because they weren't doing church right. And I was literally in the back row I was a brand new Christian. Danielle had just become a Christian through the Alpha program that where she learned about Jesus. And I'm in the back row weeping, going, I'm done. I'm never coming back to this. This is psychotic. In the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the hope of the world. <laughs> And we attack one another. I think that's what James is saying here. You got it. it. It cannot happen. And if it's happening, Jesus shut that down. Stop it. Intervene some way because that is the testimony to the world. <laughs> right? So our relationships, our bad relationships matter. Right? Again, I quote again, 1 John chapter 3, verse 15 says, Anyone who hates a brother or a sister is a murderer. Anyone who hates a brother or a sister is a murderer. Our relationships will impact the posture of praise that we have. We've become closed off to people. We become distrusting of people. We don't let people into our lives. We stay very, very distant from one another. And when we take that posture, it's hard to show up and hug one another and pray for each other, and encourage one another, and spur one another on, and be grateful, and sing songs of alleluia that Jesus is changing lives. <laughs> Worldly desires, bad relationships, and then the last one, very quickly, it's a lack of humility. A lack of humility. Right, in verse 4 of James 4, when he calls them an adulterous people, he's saying you're cheating on God Right? And he says that you, you've developed this friendship with the world. And when you develop a friendship with the world, what that means is you've now developed a posture that I don't need God. I am completely and totally self-sufficient. I've got an amazing education. I got an amazing job. I, you know, like, you know, like I got a great partner. I have amazing kids. I got enough money in the bank. I've got all of these things. And if we're really, really honest... <laughs> We go, yes, praise be to God, thank you, hallelujah, that God is the you know, creator of all things and he's Lord over all and he's given me that. But if we're not careful, we can say those words, but really in my heart, we go, no, 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 I did all this. <laughs> because I remember how hard I worked at school. You guys remember how hard those of you got, went to like college or you know, university, remember how hard that was? Show hands. That was hard, right? <laughs> well, there was a little part that wasn't so hard because I was drunk for most of it, but that's a sermon for another time, okay? <laughs> Don't listen to that part, kids. Um, <laughs> it's hard, and then you develop tools and strategies and all of that. And again, my, I didn't have fasting and prayer as part of my university strategy. I didn't. I didn't have make sure I go to church as part of my university strategy, not to pick on the young adults in school, but every time you go, I can't go to church because I have an exam, you waited to the last minute. Boom, that came from Paul, not me. <laughs> Just saying, <laughs> okay? Pride, a lack of humility. When we are prideful in ourselves, how could you ever come before the king of the universe like this? <laughs> Not my will, but your will be done. Not my wants, not my dreams, not my desires, not my plans. My life is yours. For the good of it or the bad of it, use it how you see fit. See, <laughs> that's the ultimate goal. <laughs> and when you meet, if again, if you're a non-Christian here with us today, and you meet a church like that, you meet Christians in your life like that, then suddenly it's like, what is it about that? <laughs> because I see the angry ones, and I don't want to learn from the angry ones. I want to learn from the humble ones. <laughs> because there's a joy there, there's a hope there, there's a love there, there's a peace there. All the themes of Advent, <laughs> that's very, very different than the world. Right? So the condition of our hearts determines the level of praise. So in your life group this week, for those of you who are in a life group, ask the question, how is your heart? Especially in this Christmas season, in the busyness of it and the hoopla of it and the expense of it, guard your heart. 
Remember the hope that we have in Jesus. Remember the hope that we have in Jesus, that he came, born of the Virgin Mary, lived a sinless life, and that he died for the sins that I should have died for. And instead of receiving death, I receive life. Instead of receiving judgment and condemnation, I receive peace and hope. And life is still hard. And life is still a challenge. But when we check our hearts, it changes the posture of praise. Let's pray. Lord God, I do praise you and thank you for your word the way it builds up the church, the way it encourages the church, the way it spurs on the church, the way it rebukes the church. And God, I'm grateful that that starts with me, that you want to correct me, you want to guide me, you want to rebuke me, not because you're this angry father who hates me, but because you're a loving Abba. You're a dear, dear father who cares greatly for his children and that you want the world to know of your incredible love. So Father, this Christmas season, use all of us, I ask, for your glory and help us to check our hearts. Free us from worldly desires, worldly pleasures. Restore our relationships and help us to deal with our pride so that we can praise you and that the world will know that we are your children because of your great love for us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.